I mentioned before we have 13 services over three days on three campuses, but I think this might end up being my favorite one right here as we start off, just with the orchestra and the choir. So thank you much, so much for leading us today. Well, it's that time of year again, right? The decorations are all up. I thought you might want to see the coffee house, what it looks like today. <laughs> you don't look like you believe me. Actually, this is what our house looks like. I, <laughs> I call it deck the hoop. The cookies are all baked, and probably mostly gone by this time. And the bears are out of the playoffs. So sad. And it's almost 50 degrees in December. So it's Christmas time. But I want to play a little game this morning, get a little audience participation. So I hope you came ready to help me out here a little bit. I'm calling this the Christmas Word Association Game. So what I want you thinking about is when I say the word Christmas, what words just come to mind? Don't overthink it. Just what words come to mind. All you can do is raise your hand. I'll point at you. You holler out the word, and we'll see how many we can collect in about 30 seconds, all right? Christmas Word Association game. Christmas. Raise your hand. Yes. Carols. Carols. Family. Christ. You must go to church. Okay. Joy. Presence. Somebody is honest. I like that. A few others. Let's go. I'm going to walk all the way down if I have to. Christmas tree. Two words, but that counts. Angels. Home. Hope. <laughs> Broke, he said. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> a man with four children. Yep. Yeah. Okay. Somebody else. A couple more. Yeah. Cranberries. Cranberries. Gifts. Gifts. Decorations. Decorations. Okay. I'll cut it off there. I know you could go for a while. Uh, Christmas is about a lot of things for us. Culturally, as families, it means lots of different things to us. All of them good and fun things. But today I want to talk about two words. Just two words. And interestingly, neither one of those words was mentioned today, and I was kind of hoping it would go that way. Uh, we finish our Advent series of messages today. Our series was, has been called Light of the World, and we spent the last month or so in the first 14 verses of the Gospel according to John. Uh, now, th this is not a classic Christmas text, typically. There's no star, no shepherds, uh, no angel, no manger, yet it does get us to where we need to get to today. So let me read this, most of this text for you, what we've been talking about for three weeks or so, and then we'll summarize and get into the two words we want to talk about today. John chapter 1. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things were made through Him, and without Him was not anything made that was made. In Him was life, and the life was the light of men. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. There was a man sent from God whose name was John. He came as a witness to bear witness about the light that all might believe through him. He was not the light, but came to bear witness about the light. The true light, which gives light to everyone, was coming into the world. He was in the world, and the world was made through him, yet the world did not know him. He came to his own, and his own people did not receive him. But to all who did receive him, who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God, who were born, not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. I'm going to pause there before reading that last verse. In these 13 verses or so, John points us first to what he calls the word, logos in Greek. That is the organizing principle of all things, the reason for existence of all things, he tells us that Jesus, then, is that word and brings light and life to the darkness and death that we see in the world all around us. And then he says that a man named John, John the Baptist, was sent by God to bear witness to this light. And then he goes on to say that Jesus, then, the all who believe in him, he gives them the right to become children of God. That is, born again, born anew, into a new relationship with God, into a new identity, into a new inheritance, and a new destiny. Now today we wrap up this whole series with just one verse. It's a single verse that actually is the linchpin to the entire trajectory of the bi biblical story. It's the linchpin of all of the Bible. And it explains why all these things John has told us so far about Jesus are true. And here's the one verse. 
John 1, 14. And the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. And we have seen his glory, glory as of the only Son from the Father, full of grace and truth. So I'm going to focus on two words today. Two words that at first don't seem to go together at all, but words that I believe John uses very, very intentionally. Here are the two words. Flesh and glory. Flesh and glory. First, flesh. He says the word became flesh. My wife Lorene and I have four sons, as most of you know, which means I've been through the childbirth process four times. Well, not me technically. Uh, technically, I'm a witness to the childbirth process four times. And childbirth, as many of you would agree, is not for the faint of heart. It's not. Even with all the advances in modern science and modern medicine, even with fetal monitors and epidural pain blocks and uh, ultrasound machines, it's still a, a, a messy, painful, screaming mess. It just is. It's an amazing process. It's a wonderful thing. I wouldn't have missed it for the world, but it's not, not easy at all, right? And every child is a miracle, of course. Every child is a miracle. And because they're mir miraculous little bundles of life, we tend to see all babies as beautiful. But that's not really true. My dad likes to say most babies look vaguely like Winston Churchill, but that's just his opinion. <laughs> When one of our sons was born, and I'm not at liberty to say which one, so don't ask me. Uh, when one of our sons was born, the whole process had been very difficult uh, for mom and baby. And he arrived into this world a little, a little battered. Uh, looked like he had been in a, in a, in a fight. Um, bruised and a little misshapen and so forth. But my wife and I were so grateful and so overjoyed at his arrival into the world that we looked past the swollen little face and looked past the bruising into the glorious beauty of a new life. We just did. And in the days... Uh, uh, came afterwards, just in a couple days, uh, the bruising went away and his head uh, returned to a little more pleasing shape. Um, but about a week after his birth, I had to go back to the hospital to pick up the, the, the birth photos. You know, they take those pictures right after the child is born, and you, you, I went back to pick them up. Uh, and so I went to the hospital, went to the counter, and there was a very kind lady volunteering there in the, in the maternity ward, and I said, you know, I'm here to pick up my son's uh, birth pictures. She said, well, what's his name? I told her that, that in those days it wasn't on a computer, it was a file system. So she said, she looked up, oh, here, here's this file, pulls it out and goes, here he is, let's take a look. A and she opened it up, she went, oh my. <laughs> I, she could not help herself. So when John says the word became flesh, he's saying that the logos, the reason for existence of all things, the eternal God became flesh. The creator of the universe, born into this world, as of all things, a human infant. Now, I'm going to say something that's going to sound at first wrong, like as Pastor Brian lost his mind. But hang with me as we go through this. Here's what I want to say. The word becoming flesh is a terrible idea. The word becoming flesh is a terrible idea. Now, don't get me wrong. God coming into our world is a wonderful thing, the greatest thing ever. But to do so by becoming flesh is a bad idea for so many reasons. First, historians tell us that the infant mortality rate in ancient Rome, in the ancient Roman Empire, was 30% or above, meaning that about one in three children born at that time uh, did not make it to the end of the first year of life. Which means that this God baby in the flesh had a one in three chance of not making it to his first birthday. Not a good idea. Second, human beings, human infants, are among the most helpless of all creatures on the face of the earth. Did you know, I did not know this, but did you know that a horse, when it's born, is able to stand on its own in about an hour and can walk in about two hours. It takes a human baby like a year to do both of those things, right? A human baby can't walk, can't crawl, can't feed itself, can't even lift its head, can't dial 911 on a cell phone. Think of how many things can go wrong. Even in the story of Jesus, when we read further, further on, when he was a toddler, he was almost killed by an evil king named Herod. When he was 12, his parents lost him not a good idea. 
So just in terms of feasibility and survival, flesh doesn't seem like a very good idea to me. But there's another reason it's not a good idea. Who is going to believe that? Seriously, who is going to believe that God became flesh? Who's going to believe that the God who inhabits all of eternity, who created the whole universe by just speaking words, that the God who is infinitely holy and infinitely powerful became flesh? Who's going to believe that this God could get poison ivy? That this God could get acne as a teenager? That this God could stub his toe on a bench? That this God, if he fell when running and scraped his knee, would bleed just like another child? Who's going to believe that? And by the way, this is still one of the greatest stumbling blocks to faith in our world today. And who's going to believe the whole virgin birth thing? That's not the easiest thing to wrap your mind around, is it? And yet, the culmination of John's soaring description of the eternal Word of God is this. And the Word became flesh. As one writer put it, ultimate mystery born with a skull you could crush one-handed. And dwelt among us, literally set up his tent moved into the neighborhood where we lived and lived a real, historical, flesh-and-blood life with family, friends, and work, and eventually died a real, physical death. So, let's assume that we accept all that, that we kind of get all that, the flesh part. And then there's another surprise. He says, and we have seen his glory. Glory is of the only Son from the Father, full of grace and truth. The second word I want to talk about is glory. Think for a moment about um, the most famous person, most important person you've ever met or been near in your lifetime. Just think for a moment. Anybody here in this room today ever met or been in the same room with a sitting or former United States president? Raise your hand. Oh, look at how many important people. Who? Jimmy Carter. Kennedy. Reagan. You were at Eisenhower's funeral and they were all there. Eisenhower was president when I was born. So, who else? Gerald Ford. Do we have any others? George Bush. Bush. Who? LBJ, well, we have a very, very, very important group here today. Or how about, um, anybody had an audience with the Pope? (laughs) I got to hear Pope John Paul II speak in St. Peter's Square in Rome in 1979, in person, but I was about 300 yards away. I could barely see him up in in his uh, balcony area. But we live near Chicago. How about Oprah? Anybody been to an Oprah show? Okay, I knew somebody. Okay. How about anybody, Michael Jordan? Been, Been close to Michael Jordan? Saw him play, but not actually met him. How about uh, Da Koch? Mike Ditka, anybody? Oh, see, yeah. That's, now that's really, now we're talking celebrity, right? <laughs> well, John writes, And the Word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we have seen his glory, glory as of the only Son from the Father, full of grace and truth. Now the word glory is the Greek word doxa, from which we get our word doxology. And it simply means renown, fame, or honor. And it's closely related to the ancient Hebrew word kabod in the Old Testament, which means heavy or significant. For example, um, celebrities in our culture are, have a kind of glory in a way. That is, they have a kind of weight. If one of those people we mentioned moments ago, if a former president or um, a famous movie star or an athlete walked into this service today, we would all feel the weight of their glory in a sense, because we'd all be aware. The whole room would sort of tip that direction. It'd be hard for you to concentrate on what I'm talking about up here if you knew one of them was in the audience. That's the way glory works. And in the Bible, glory is a word almost exclusively used for God or God's presence or angelic beings. And glory shows up in the, in the well-known story of Jesus' birth. Listen to these familiar words. Once again, Luke chapter 2. 
In those days, a decree went out from Caesar Augustus that all the world should be registered. This was the first registration when Quirinius was governor of Syria, and all went to be registered, each to his own town. And Joseph also went up from Galilee, from the town of Nazareth to Judea, to the city of David, which is called Bethlehem, because he was of the house and lineage of David, to be registered with Mary, his betrothed, who was with child. And while they were there, the time came for her to give birth. And she gave birth to her firstborn son, and wrapped him in swaddling cloths, and laid him in a manger, because there was no room for them in the inn. And in the same region, there were shepherds out in the field, keeping watch over their flock by night. And an angel of the Lord appeared to them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were filled with great fear. I want you to notice something here that, that you might not notice on first glance. Uh, Luke, as Luke tells this story, he leads us on a progression, I think very intentionally, from the most powerful to the least powerful. If I go back and go through the story, he starts with Caesar Augustus, emperor of Rome, ruler of the known world, a man who was thought of as a god, small g. Caesar Augustus. Then we see Quirinius, who was governor under the rule of Caesar. Then we see Joseph, who's just a Jewish carpenter. And then we see Mary, who's a young Jewish woman getting ready to give birth. And then we see a child, a Jewish baby in a world dominated by Rome and lying in a manger from the most powerful to the least powerful and then we see the shock and surprise we see glory glory what strikes me about all this and the real surprise of the story is that john is saying glory is in the flesh glory is in the six or seven pounds of human flesh wrapped up tight in swaddling clothes and lying in an animal's feeding trough glory Now, I started by saying, sort of tongue-in-cheek, that flesh was a terrible idea. And from a certain human perspective, it, it kind of is. But John is saying that God becoming flesh is glory. Why? Let me mention just three reasons. There may be more, but here's three reasons. First, through flesh we can know what God is like. Through flesh we know what God is like. Jesus said in John 14, He who has seen me has seen the Father. Without flesh, God is just an idea. Sort of a concept. A vague, distant being. But with flesh, in flesh, God becomes real. God becomes near. He enters into the blood, sweat, and tears, joys, and sorrows of our everyday lives. Through Jesus, God comes to the fleshly parts of our lives, the unholy parts of our lives, where we work, where we clean house, where we go to school and study, changing the diapers, buying the groceries, getting the flu shots, taking the final exams. God comes to the nursing homes and the hospitals. The word becoming flesh means that God cares. And more than that means God loves and God pursues That he comes to us, even to the point of becoming like us. So that we can see what he is like. So we can see the depth of his love. So we can see what he really thinks about us. So we can see, John says, his glory. Secondly, it's through flesh that, that our sins can be covered. Hebrews chapter 9 tells us that without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness of sins. And if we think about it, without flesh, there is no body. Without body, there is no blood. And without blood, there is no forgiveness of sin. Because without flesh, there could be no cross. Without the cross, there could be no death. Without death, there is no resurrection. Without flesh, we are still in our sins. And without hope in the world, that's what the Apostle Paul says. But because the Word became flesh, our sins are covered. Because the Word became flesh, our sins were nailed to the cross, canceled forever, and we can know grace and truth. Thirdly, through flesh we can know we are not alone. The Bible tells us that God has always wanted to be with, to dwell with His people. Starting in Genesis And we're told that God's habit was to walk with Adam and Eve in the cool of the day. Throughout the Old Testament, 
The people of Israel, when God would, would go before them in the pillar of fire, or sm- uh, pillar of smoke by day and pillar of fire by night, through his tabernacle and through the temple with the Holy of Holies where God's presence would dwell among his people. All the way to the end of the Bible, the book of Revelation, that, that gives us a hint about what God's plan is, what his promise is. In Revelation 21, verse 3, we read, And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Behold, the dwelling place of God is with man. He will dwell with them, and they will be his people, and God himself will be with them as their God. So when John says the word became flesh and dwelled among us, he means, he's saying that we are not alone. He's saying that you are not alone. It means that wherever you have been, Spiritually speaking, in your life, God has come to you. Wherever you are now, spiritually speaking, God comes to you today. And when John says, we have seen his glory, glory as of the Son come from the Father, full of grace and truth, he's saying that there is nothing, nothing more significant, there's nothing more important, there's nothing with more weight In all of our lives, in all of our existence, there's nothing more glorious than this child of flesh lying in a manger. Now, Christmas is lots of things. We we threw out a lot of words a few minutes ago. Christmas, culturally speaking, family speaking, Christmas is lots of things. Traditions and family and food and presents and trees and lights. And I hope that we all enjoy all of that. We plan on enjoying all of that at our home. But Christmas, when you cut down to the core of it, is about two words. Flesh. Of all things, flesh. And glory. Matthew, the gospel writer, tells us all this took place to fulfill what the Lord had spoken by the prophet. Behold, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which means God with us. Would you bow with me as I close? Lord, we thank you today for what we celebrate together. You came in flesh, that we can know you, what you're like, that we can know your salvation, that we can know your grace, and that we might see your glory. So today we thank you for being the God who is with us. Amen. We're going to close in our traditional way at this service by singing together Silent Night, Holy Night. As the music begins, I'm going to walk over and light the Christ candle, and then I'll step down, and we'll we'll all stand, and we will pass the light using our little electronic candles, one to the other, as symbolically bearing witness to Jesus as the light of the world.